Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle and this is my week one Victober wrap up. I love Victober and so I am going to do a weekly wrap up throughout the month just to let you know what I'm currently reading, what I finished, the things that I am doing that are Victober related. I thought that would be fun to do. So I'm going to tell you about what I have started reading this uh, this week um, and I just dived right in um, you know I just love Victober and I, I want to read all the things and of course you can't but you know I'm gonna do my very best so I started reading The Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy which is the group read for the month and um, I'm I'm actually really enjoying it um, Thomas Hardy wrote this book in 1886 but it opens much earlier. It opens uh, kind of around 1830, a little before 1830. I find um, this book, now I haven't read a lot of Hardy, Confession Time, I haven't read a lot of Hardy, but I find this book very readable. Um, the chapters are shorter, uh, which, which I think helps. Sometimes with Victorian books, the chapters are really long and you kind of just feel like you're slogging through. But the chapters are short and I found the plot just really engaging so um, the whole catalyst that gets this story going is that our main character Michael Henshaw is that his name Henchard he sells his wife and baby at the beginning of this book they're quite young you know maybe 20 um, and they are they've gone to this fair in this town and he gets drunk and he sells his wife and then um, and then the story promptly moves ahead 20 years and Michael is now the mayor of Casterbridge he's a wealthy man a business owner a respected man uh, and what's going to happen uh, so I am um, I've kept up very well so I am I've read 16 chapters and like I said I've been really enjoying it I find the plot engaging I'm really curious to know what's gonna happen where is this story going to go I was also really curious about this plot point of selling his wife and baby because it is it's shocking to the modern day reader and in on the Goodreads group there have there have been many comments from people about how shocking that first chapter is when he sells her so I decided to do a little bit <laughs> of investigating and I found some really interesting things I'm going to link to this article in the description box below if you want to read the full article to yourself on history.com I found this English men once sold their wives instead of getting divorced. This was published in uh, 2018. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, wife selling was a weird custom with a practical purpose. So here's a picture from the article of a man selling his wife. So I'm just going to read part of the article to you because I found this fascinating. Between the 17th and 19th centuries, divorce was prohibitively expensive. Some lower class, so lower class British people didn't get them. They sold their wives instead. The custom seems outlandish today, but it could be found in public places like markets, taverns, and fairs. Historians disagree on when or how the custom started and how widespread it was, but it seems to have been an accepted alternative divorce among lower class Britons. Wife sales were crude and funny, but they also served a very real purpose since it was so hard to get a divorce. Wife selling arose as a form of faux divorce. It wasn't technically legal, but the way it unfolded in public made it valid in the eyes of many. Here's an illustration that is from the actually from the mayor of Casterbridge, which I thought was fascinating. Oddly enough, the sales took on the form of cattle auctions of the time. After announcing the sale, the man would put a ribbon or a rope around his wife's neck, arm or waist and lead her to market, either an actual market or another public place. 
Then he'd auction her off, often after, after declaring her virtues to onlookers. Once she was purchased by another man, the previous marriage was considered null and void, and the new buyer was financially responsible for his new wife. Usually, wife sales were merely symbolic. There was just one bidder, the, wo the woman's new lover. Sometimes there wasn't a designated buyer, though, and an actual bidding war broke out. Men could announce a wife sale without informing their wife, and she might be bid on by total strangers. But women had to agree to the sale. And then uh, at the end of the article, it says this. Overall, writes historian Lawrence Stone, the format of the sale was designed to seem legit. Quote, all this elaborate symbolism had a very real purpose, which was to try to make the sale appear as legally binding as possible, especially with respect to any future financial responsibility by the husband for the wife, he writes. Some wife sellers even drew up elaborate contracts to make the ritual seem as sale-like as possible. Technically, though, wife sales didn't dissolve the underlying marriage and police eventually began breaking up the sales. Stone thinks that the practice was extremely rare and that it attracted more attention than it deserves because of the temptation to spread word of the strange ritual far and wide, and even to make up fictional wife sales to sell newspapers. In the end, writes historian Roderick Phillips, too little is known about wife sales to enable us to draw firm conclusions. What is clear, though, is that attending, talking about, and inventing wife sales was amusing indeed. Even the seller and his wife were usually described as gleeful and happy during the sale. Take, Thomas Th take Joseph Thompson, who allegedly sold his wife in 1832, listed his wife's bad qualities, calling her a born serpent, and advising the buyers to avoid frolicsome women as you would a mad dog, a roaring lion, a loaded pistol, cholera. Then he listed her assets, which included the ability to milk cows, sing, and serve as a drinking companion. I therefore offer here with all her perfections and imperfections for the sum of 50 shillings, he concluded, adding a fun flourish to the end of his marriage. Wife sales largely ended in 1857 when divorce became easier. With it died a custom and tales of the tradition are just as bizarre and entertaining as they were then. Isn't that interesting? I find that so fascinating. So yeah, The Mayor of Casterbridge is turning out to be a very interesting read. I'm really curious to know where it's going to go. And I did note one quote that I wanted to share with you. And in autumn, airy spheres of thistledown floated into the same street, lodged upon the shop fronts, blew into drains, and innumerable tawny and yellow leaves skimmed along the pavement and stole through people's doorways into their passages with a hesitating scratch on the floor like the skirts of timid visitors. Okay, so there you have it. Um, that's what I have so far for the Mayor of Casterbridge. All right, and I've also been reading Jack Shepard by William Harrison Ainsworth. I'm reading this on my tablet as it's an ebook from the library. I'm 105 pages into this and I am quite enjoying that one as well. I've read three other books by Ainsworth and so I knew that I would enjoy this one as well. It is based on a true story, based on a true person, uh, an 18th century criminal. Ainsworth wrote this book. It was serialized between 1839 and 1840, but it opens in 1703. Um, so I have read Epoch the First, 1703, Jonathan Wilde, Jack Shepard, um, where we learn that Jack Shepard was born in Newgate, where his mother was a prisoner on the day his father was hanged. <laughs> So this poor kid. So what's interesting so far is that we really starting to like it's I'm I'm thinking that we're going to get a story of nature versus nurture and is criminality bred in the bone kind of. I think that's the question that's being asked. Um, and I've started Epoch the Second, which takes place in 1715, James Thames, Thames Darrell. Um, where Jack Shepard is now Wood's apprentice. Wood is a carpenter. So yeah, I've really been enjoying that one as well. And so I will continue on. I 
I've also uh, continued with um, Gothic Tales by Elizabeth Gaskell. I started this last year for Victober and I am hoping to finish it this year. I'm, I'm reading Lois the Witch right now, which is actually a novella. Most of what's in here are short stories, but Lois the Witch is 87 pages, so I would call it a novella. And I've read chapter one of Lois the Witch. And I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying that one. That one is a historical fiction as well because it's set in the 1600s, 16, the early 1600s, I'm thinking. Oh no, the late, 1691. Okay, I am also, I just decided kind of off the cuff to listen to the woman in white while I do other things, make a puzzle or whatever. And so I've really been enjoying that. The Woman in White is my all time favorite Victorian novel ever by Wilkie Collins. And I'm listening to this one through my library and it's being read by Ian Holm. I'm really enjoying that, but it's a very long, audiobook it's like 25 hours and I'm I'm eight percent into it um, but yeah I'm really enjoying that I have read some poetry so I can cross off one of the prompts already and uh, that's Roz's prompt was to read some poetry and I don't really read poetry I don't tend to like it Maybe I don't get it I'm not entirely sure but I chose three short pro poems that were um, recommended by Roz, In a London Drawing Room by George Eliot, The Darkling Thrush by Thomas Hardy, and Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. They were fine. I'm not sure if I got them. I, I don't know. My favorite of the three was The Darkling Thrush because I like birds. <laughs> so anyway, there you have it. I read them. They were fun. And then I am also reading The Lodger by Mary Bellock Lowndes, which I am also reading through my library. Um, so it's an ebook. I've read 75 pages of that so far. And this was first published in 1914, and it's based on the Jack the Ripper killings in London. And it's the first novel that was ever written about those killings, which I find very interesting. Um, and that one has been, uh, that one's been really good as well. Um, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about the fog in London, and so it's very atmospheric. Robert and Ellen Bunting are really in desperate straits, and they need, they need to bring in some money, and so they've been trying to take in lodgers, but it hasn't worked out very well, and then one night the ma a man comes to the door, and uh, agrees to become their lodger. He's looking for a room to, to, to let. And hilariously, his name is Mr. Sleuth, <laughs> which, is, which is really weird. So while all of this is going on, there are murders that have been taking place. When the story opens, four murders have already taken place. And when the story opens on the first page, the fifth one is being announced by the newsboys. And uh, they're calling it out, the Avenger, the Avenger at his work again. So in this book, um, the author has chosen to call the killer his name um, because he leaves behind like a thing, a tag on, on the victims and he calls himself um, the Avenger. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. I've also been uh, working on this crossword puzzle that Kate Howe has put together. I always enjoy doing those. I'm gonna try as, and do as much as I can before I start to cheat, but inevitably I have to Google because I, I can't get all of the answers. Okay, and then there's one more book. I just got it from the library. This was a recommendation from one of my subscribers in, it could have been my TBR video, it could have been my first uh, Murder Mystery Monday, Victober video, I can't remember, but they recommended this and it's called The Lady and the Highwayman by Sarah M. Eden. Now this is actually a romance and so uh, it all depends on how romance heavy this is, but the plot just sounded great. Elizabeth Black is the headmistress of a girl's school and a well-respected author of Silver Fork novels. Stories written both for and about the upper class ladies of Victorian society. But by night, she writes very different kinds of stories. 
the penny dreadfuls that are all the rage among working class men. Under the pseudonym Mr. King, Elizabeth has written about dashing heroes fighting supernatural threats and dangerous outlaws romancing helpless women. They contain all the adventure and mystery that her real life lacks. Fletcher Walker began life as a street urchin, but is now the most successful author in the penny dreadful market. That is, until Mr. King started taking all of his readers and his profits. No one knows who King is, including Fletcher's fellow members of the Dread Penny Society, a fraternity of authors dedicated to secretly fighting for the rights of the less fortunate. Determined to find the elusive Mr. King, Fletcher approaches Miss Black. As a fellow author, she is well known among the high class writers. Perhaps she could be persuaded to make some inquiries as to Mr. King's whereabouts. Elizabeth agrees to help Fletcher if only to ensure her secret identity is never discovered. For the first time, Elizabeth experiences the thrill of a cat and mouse adventure reminiscent of one of her own novels as she tries to throw Fletcher off her scent. But the more time they spend together, the more she loses her heart. It's upper class against working class, author against author, where readers, reputations, and romance are all on the line. So that's what attracted me to this book, the fact that it's about people who write Penny Dreadfuls. I just think that's, that's fantastic. So I'm going to give this one a whirl. This was uh, first published in 2019. Okay, so that there you have it. That's what I've been doing this first week of Victober. Um, it has been a lot of fun so far, and I can't wait to keep going, and I hope to read much, much more. Uh, so let me know in the comment section down below if you've read any of these books, or if you are reading any of these books. Uh, and if not, what are you reading for Victober? I would love to know. And I will see you for another video soon. Bye.